Life's defining moments don't always feel that great when they are happening. In the moment, they can feel challenging, uncomfortable, difficult, impossible even. But with hindsight, they can take on a different shape. Each week, I ask my guests to share their biggest life learnings to date as we explore those difficult, swampy, infuriating times and how they shaped them, all from a comfortable distance that's afforded them the time to take the positive out of what might have seemed nothing but negative at the time. Because whether it's risks, excuses, obstacles, opportunities, both missed and taken, successes, regrets, curveballs, weaknesses, strengths, and perhaps the hardest lesson of all, being wrong, they are the reason they are the person they are today, the person sitting in front of me on this episode of The Emma Gunn Show. Eddie Sternberg is a London-born writer, director and producer who is arguably one of the most exciting new names in film. I say new because Eddie's debut film, I Used to Be Famous, starring Ed Skrine, Eleanor Matsura and Leo Long, which is adapted from his short film of the same name, was released by Netflix just last year in September 2022 and promptly became one of the streaming platform's most watched films in over 60 countries, taking top 10 positions of two in the UK, eight in America and four globally. I Used to Be Famous explores the friendship between fallen pop idol Vinnie D and autistic teen Stevie, who bond over music. And it has won worldwide praise, not just for its storytelling and performances, but for its representation of neurodivergence in film. Screen Daily announced Eddie as Screen International Star of Tomorrow 2022 in their filmmaker category, an accolade previously awarded in 2014 to Phoebe Waller-Bridge and in 2009 to Richard Ayoade. The film's lead, Leo Long, was nominated for a British Independent Film Award for Best Breakthrough Performance, a moment Eddie describes as genuinely one of the greatest moments of my life. I Used to Be Famous has an 80% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and Digital Spy included it in its annual roundup of the best movies of 2022. Friend of the show and respected film critic James King heaped huge praise on I Used to Be Famous, describing it as a film with a big heart. And as if that wasn't enough, Mark Kermode, arguably the authority on film, invited Eddie to speak at the British Film Institute late last year at his monthly film event where he interviews the best of the best in film and cinema. Eddie appeared alongside the actresses Kate Hudson and Catherine Hahn and Star Wars Knives Out and Glass Onion director Ryan Johnson to talk about his experience making I Used to Be Famous. It's an incredible story, but the success we're seeing now is a result of a journey that has had its fair share of highs and lows. I am sure, Eddie, there are times you felt defeated, perhaps wondered whether you should have started in the first place, and worried whether any of this, the success you're enjoying now, was ever going to happen. So welcome to the podcast, Eddie Sternberg. I can't wait to hear this story. Oh, thank you very much. That doesn't feel like that is me, but that is all true stuff that you said. <laughs> I did. I saw that you said something like, you're still coming to terms with the fact that it's actually happened. Yes. I, I, well, I'm still coming to terms with the fact that I'm, I'm a functioning adult every day, getting dressed and having being a dad of two, let alone all the stuff you just mentioned. So <laughs> yes, there's a lot of bewildered kind of looks every day. Well, where I would like to start is with risk. Because I think taking risks is such a huge thing. And it's the thing that I think we can talk ourselves off the ledge of doing. But risk really does. It's the sort of starting point for this journey because you did, you took a leap, didn't you, by going freelance and mm. starting what you hoped would end up here with no idea of how that was going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I sort of... I'd started uh, working at a production company in-house, which I sort of put off for quite a while. Um, I had my own little mini production company, a kind of two-man band called Superplex Pictures. And um, the the filmmaker that I, that I ran that company with, Adam Baruch, um, and I both didn't really want to run businesses. We wanted to make films. And I think fundamentally every business decision it was uh it was quite clear that that's that's what we wanted to do is we probably didn't make the right decision for for the business but made it for our film careers if that makes sense right so i'd kind of put off um what i knew was was needed which was basically going in house and getting knowing exactly what was coming in every year and you know just settling down and settling getting my roots down and my long suffering wife sort of was very supportive but as soon as i said i think i might need to get a real job she looked at me as if she's been thinking the same thing for a while um <laughs> and then yeah so I, I went in-house and that sort of gave me the ability to exercise the directing muscle working with really good clients but my time was very very limited to uh dedicate anything towards my script that I was co-writing um and any other ideas that I was trying to sort of you know cultivate but when I, it got to a point where 
that time was just constantly being taken up with the day job because the day job wasn't a nine to five. It was quite, you know, an intense 14 to 18 hour kind of day regularly, you know, pre-production, production, production, post-production. And it, it was, as I say, it was great to exercise that directing muscle, but it sort of, by taking away all my creative time away from that, it, it reached a point where I needed to take that leap. Do you, did you feel like the dream was slipping away? Like in trying to make a decision to provide and to have some stability, you could feel the dream getting further and further away in the distance? Yeah, I think so. Um, it, was always, it was always there and I always kept the faith. But I mean, I would, I would get up at sort of like 5.30, get to work for 6, 6, 6.30, um, as soon as the Starbucks would open next door, the office, <laughs> and I, w- I would create more hours in the day to sort of work on the script. Mm. And then I'd get home a lot of the time, you know, eight or nine o'clock, and then I would just work. And it, it's it's not conducive to, you know, having creative ideas um, or coming up with anything or just, you know, when, when you're just doing it just because you're in front of a screen, you need to have that, you need to have the the air, you know, I'm no doctor or scientist, <laughs> but you need to have the air going on up there, moving mm-hmm. around, the blood moving around. And I think if you're spending too much of your time dedicating it to the day job, it's quite hard to kind of do both, but you have to at times, you know. So the risk was going freelance, not pursuing the actual dream. Because I think a lot of people would think the idea of making a film and putting any time and effort into that would be risk the riskier thing. Mm. But actually, that's not your perspective. Well, it kind of is in that, you know, I went freelance to try and make it. The, the reason why it was so risky to go freelance for me at that time in my life was because my wife and I were starting to plan for a baby. And um, ironically, I quit the job on the Wednesday and then we found out we were pregnant like three days after. So although it was like the plan and it was like, yeah, I'm going to go freelance, try for a baby the reality three days later was like, did I make a massive, massive <laughs> mistake? Because this is actually happening now. Um, so yeah, I, I the the risk for me was basically now that we were going to have a baby, had a mortgage to just go totally freelance, not knowing what's going to come in. The, our, our film was still quite far away. Like we, we'd spent years working on the script. This is me and my co-writer, Zach Klein, and my producers, uh, Chris Pensakowski and Colly McCarthy. And we spent years and years sort of working on the script, getting it better, um, adding little bits of value to the to the project. So we we you know at one point we had uh, this uh, this great script editor called uh, Ed Clark who was brilliant, and then that made the script a lot better and sort of ready for the industry. Uh, and then we added uh, an exec. We added Damien Jones and Paul Grindy who'd made some amazing stuff. Damien Jones produced The Iron Lady with Meryl Streep. So we were sort of ticking it along and adding bits of value to the the package that we were sort of selling to the industry essentially Mm. so but but at the same time that there was no guarantee that it would ever happen you know there's so many things that sort of sort of stay in development hell for years and years and we were already in development purgatory for uh for you know five years at that point so for me it was sort of a leap of faith that it's like i'm going to spend not have any income i'm going to dedicate all my time to work on the script to try and get this film made and try to cultivate, you know, freelance contacts and all that kind of stuff. And then the pandemic hits. And then the pandemic hit, yeah. So that was um, incredibly hard for for everyone. Um, but I think a lot of people that fell through the cracks, like me, it was quite difficult as well because obviously we had a newborn baby. Our, our baby was born the month before lockdown. Uh, so it was, yeah, lockdown was March 2020. February 2020, yeah. And baby was born 17th of February. Um, and so I found myself in a position where I'd spent seven months at that point sort of cultivating um, all my freelance contacts. And I had a lot of work lined up and it was like, right, I'm going to take a month paternity. You know, this is the I got the ability to do that, mm-hmm. you know, being freelance. And I'm going to take advantage of that as long as I can justify that with all the work that I've kind of lined up, which I did. Pandemic hit. All of that work fell through. And then the reality that for the first time where I actually kind of did lose faith that the film would happen. I always had that faith apart mm-hmm. from that one moment. I think it was like in reality, that was probably like the, the worst moment in my entire life because I felt I felt I I needed to, I had a wife on mat leave. I had a child that I had to provide, provide for and I couldn't provide for them because mm-hmm. all the work fell through what I 
would do. There was no uh, industry for what I did really at that point. And then the film, which was just, you know, the big kind of dream was just like, how is this ever going to happen if I can't even feed my kid kind of thing? So then what I did is I kind of like doubled down into try to do what I could do, which is basically just like write a new script. That was essentially what I did. That was quite difficult with not much sleep and, you know, feeling incredibly down. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened there. Were people around you saying, for crying out loud, Eddie, just cut your losses? Because you're talking about five years at this point mm. of, of input into something that had had reached a point where the world had changed as much as anything else. And it's like, is this really a viable, realistic dream for you now? Mm. Was it just, was it in your head as much as, or was it other people as well? My family have always been really supportive. I think it's because they've known that I always kind of didn't excel in much at school apart from a very, <laughs> apart from the creative stuff, you know, so photography or, you know, and then uh, the dream, I wanted to be a filmmaker since I was five, I think. Why? I went to go see Spartacus. <laughs> <laughs> My dad took me to see Spartacus, which is quite, to, Kubrick at five is quite intense. And it had a weird effect on me, basically. Um, I, I say five, because that's kind of the romantic thing to say. I, I don't really know exactly, but I, I think it was when I first saw my first film. And I was just, I've always been blown away by it. I've always been that kind of the weirdo that just would sort of always make the choice not to go out and party with his friends when he's younger and just stay in and watch a film. I would do that a lot yeah I don't have any friends no I'm kidding I do um <laughs> I know what you mean though yeah. because I have had some of my most intense experiences via films that's right. why I love them so much mm. because they are little portals to emotions that are easier to manage <laughs> in a cinema or your living room yes than in real life Absolutely. with other people yeah yeah it, it's true but then why is your favorite film <laughs> you know Jurassic Park no I'm kidding um there's, we can't relate to Jurassic Park no, I'm kidding. Um, no, it's not Jurassic Park, it's not Jurassic Park. your favorite film <laughs> um, from memory, it's got to be an Arnie film, surely. Yes. Yeah, okay. it's in the top three. Terminator okay. Two, Judgment Day. Perfect. Um, <laughs> moving on. So yeah, where were we? You talking about very serious stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I've, I've always wanted to to be a director, specifically to direct. Mm. And then I started writing as a kind of means to an end. And then I found myself really enjoying that process. Nowadays, it's they're two very very different things: writing and directing, which we can come on to. But. Um, mm. Yeah. I wouldn't like now, if you said to me, what does a director do? Obviously, you know, and you've done it. Mm. But I would be like, well, mm, I would imagine that a director does a lot of things. And actually, probably each director directs in a unique way. Like there's no there's no dummy's guide to directing. Is there? I mean, there's loads of books about it, <laughs> which I've pretended to have read. But um, <laughs> I, I always find... Um, uh, for me, just the experience is how you learn everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I remember I was, I, I went to university, I studied uh, film and media studies. It was very much an excuse for me to just watch films and get a degree watching films. Um, no, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was the dream. I did have a chance to kind of like dive into, you know, uh, a lot of sort of the, the theoretical and philosoph philosophical side of film. And, you know, you'd have like a, a term on horror and then you'd have one on high concept films of the 90s where I, I'll be honest, I did just watch Top Gun in the lecture and be like, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> but there wasn't that much practical stuff for that course. It was much more theoretical. Mm -hmm. I then started out as a runner at um, a production company called Partizan. They do a lot of uh, the big music videos and, and commercials um, and I think some films now as well. And some of the people that, that are represented by Partizan, like Michel Gondry and um, Daniel Wolf, like some amazing filmmakers. Uh, I learned a lot more on set of a music video in like three days as a runner than I did, you know, at university, you know, doing a film studies degree. So when people people ask me a lot of the time, you know, like film school, is it for them? Uh, or, you know, a film media degree kind of thing. For me, it's it's all about what is it you specifically want to do. If you mm. want to direct, which is what I wanted to do, you need as much practical experience as possible. And you need to get onto set and you need to start doing your own stuff, you know. That's really interesting. So talk to me about that because I'm quite interested about this because we are, at the moment, there's a definite culture of everyone thinking that they can kind of do it just by, I'm born to do it. You know, that kind of entitlement piece mm. that's very loud at the moment about particular age groups. And I know that when I was starting in journalism, it was about sitting in the corner, watching, doing the grunt work, making 
making sure you made not just tea, but good tea. Yeah. Though I do apologize to my former deputy editor of the Seven Oaks Chronicle because I used to make him terrible tea. But anyway. How do you make bad tea? I'm sorry. Like, it, Well, he didn't it's... like it and he's been vocal about it for 20 years. I don't understand people that have, yeah, anyway. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, should... sure, I'm sure it was great. I, I believe it to be good too. But um, it was about sort of sitting and waiting your turn and watching what other people were doing, mm. which may be a skill that or the missing piece from what this whole entitlement conversation is about. So when you went on those sets and you said you learned more in three days on a music video, mm. was it because you just watched and just let your eyes take in and compute every single thing that was happening? Yeah, but it, it's, it's more... It's watching it, but it's also experiencing it, you know, and being in, especially if you're a runner as well, and you're kind of, you're the first on on set and, and the last to leave. Mm -hmm. And it is just, yeah, experiencing it, watching it, taking it all in, seeing what everyone does. Because a lot of people don't realize that actually they might want to be in a different department than what they think. You know, they might get onto set and just be amazed by what, you know, the gaffer's doing, you know, with, with, with the lighting, because that's a real art, actually, you know, mm -hmm. what, the, what the cinematographer's doing. And a lot of it is a rude awakening when you get onto set because it's it's quite an extreme uh, experience. I think a any set it's always problem solving essentially with creative solutions. If you're a director specifically, I think it is ab about just diving in and experiencing, but then also doing stuff yourself. So just like making stuff. Mm. And I, like, filmmakers always say like just go out and make something every weekend and and then you'll get better. And it's like. That, that is true, but it's a lot more nuanced than that. I think I always quote Tarantino, which makes me, uh, which is really embarrassing because my friends take the mic out of me. It's like, <laughs> you've made one film and now you're quoting Tarantino, uh, my friend. The thing that I found really inspiring is when he was just like, go and make Reservoir Dogs, <laughs> right? Which everyone in the audience, when he said it, laughed. But he's just like, I'm not even being a smart ass. Like, that film was dynamite. And if you if you aspire and make something that is dynamite and you throw it in someone's lap, it's it's going to explode in their face and they can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just about going out and getting something made. It's about going out, finding something that you're passionate to make and making that and then getting better and better and better and just like demanding attention, you know. So that means that is that what kept you motivated through was it six and a half years, just over six years to get to go from idea to completion? Yeah, I think for me, it was yeah, it was that belief that I could I had this like nervous, creative energy, I think, if that's a way of putting it, just this nervous energy, this anxiety where it's like, this is so good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I believe this thing could be amazing. Mm. Um, I just want to be able to prove that to people you know I had I had it bubbling away and then the more you work on it it's like yes yes yeah you know what I mean a lot of that is you know there's projects that that you think could be that good but you have a realization if you don't have that burning desire to kind of make it that actually mm. maybe that's not the right one at the moment maybe it needs a rethink and I think that that nervous energy is really really key just to keep the faith because everything in the world especially trying to make a first film you know you're, you're asking people to fund you know you can get a film made for, for much cheaper now, but like in terms of, you know, going the industry route, you know, you apply for public funding and a film that's just under a million or something is is kind of what you what we aspired to for I used to be famous for a while. And then you're asking people to fund that and you haven't really got a track record of doing it. You've got, you know, for in my case, I had a couple of short films that did like relatively well at festivals. Um, I got signed by an agent, but it's really, really difficult to kind of mm -hmm. get people to back you, you know. So you have to have that passion when it might not be coming from the outside world. Yeah, I think as the writer director, uh, so I wrote and directed The Shore and then I brought my co-writer Zach Klein on board because as I said, like my, my directing was always the number one for me mm -hmm. and, and Zach was a very talented writer that I felt I didn't feel ready to kind of write something on my own and I, we had a really, he had a really good ideas and we collaborated really well. But I think as the kind of, I guess, showrunner for, for the piece, you know, you more than anyone need to have that passion and desire and and faith that it's going to be brilliant because everyone else has to buy into that you know and then it kind of feeds into your team uh, and that kind of in in the in the years trying to make it you know we had a team of uh my co-writer my two producers um and that was the core and and, and then we had our casting director Isabella Rodolphin and all these people were kind of on their way up I kind of caught everyone at a good time and everyone kind of believed in the project but if I ever let that faith sort of die down then it's it's going to be the same for them do you know what I mean 
you you need to be the the sort of the steady port that they're all looking for for the reassurance that that's quite a responsibility actually mm yeah i, I mean that moment where i did lose the faith for the for for like half a second uh is a bit more than that in, in lockdown <laughs> um we w my producer collie and isabella we had a conversation actually and it was should we pursue this still you know considering what's happening in the world and and just where we were at in the journey of trying to get it made because you have certain avenues you can go down mm. you know in terms of financing and all that kind of stuff in fact sorry that's what i was meaning to say before is that you're you're trying to convince people to put money into your project so unless you have like total passion and like you're you're almost um fanatical you know about about this idea it's never going to happen mm. you know um and then you know once you made a few successful films then you can just be like yeah whatever i'll just make a film because you know uh fund me you know i look forward to arrogant eddie in the, yes, in the future yeah, i'll come back and i'll just be you know wearing a beret and uh <laughs> Yeah, anyway. So I'm always interested in the idea of self-sabotage, which brings us on to the excuse, the idea that um, we can put these obstacles in our way that don't actually fundamentally exist, but they are very, very real to us. So during, whether it's the process of making the film or just in life, what is the excuse that you make that you know is BS, but <laughs> you, uh, you still continue to make it? <laughs> Uh, it's time. It's making excuses of saying I don't have enough time when actually I prove to myself that you do have enough time or you can make extra time if you need to get something done, mm. you know, because I think back, back when I when I was, you know, working this um, this day job and creating more hours in the day, I think my mentality was like no one owes you anything, you know, uh, and I actually got that when we went on the short film circuit and we made the short film. You're, you're playing your film, you, no one knows who you are. So you need that audience that are sat there, most of them are sat there because they've made their own short film. So, mm. uh, so you know, and, and some other people, you know, are, are there because they want to watch short films, but no one owes you anything. So you need to grab their attention and you need to make them, you know, want to give you the time of day. So that mentality kind of fed into, you know, just constantly wanting to improve it, constantly doing all that kind of stuff. Um, but now, like, you know, as a dad of two kids and having not as much sleep, you know, it's very easy to kind of just be like, I, the, these settings aren't perfect for my creativity. Um, <laughs> but it's never perfect. Do you know what I mean? I try to say that to my, you know, six month old who's like dribbling, like, you know, what do I expect her to say back to me? It's like, dad, just, I'm sorry. I'll try and sleep some more. Um, yeah. So I think if you need, if you want to get something done enough, time isn't really going to be an issue, if that makes sense. No matter how hard it is, you just need to make it work. I'm kind of contradicting myself from what I said earlier because I was talking about, you know, things not being ideal for like, a, for um, things not being uh, conducive to mm -hmm. creativity. And, and that is true, but you need to, if you want something enough, you kind of need to overcome that yeah. in whichever way you, possible if that makes sense and there's a guest i had on the show a couple of years ago pre-pandemic jeff thompson incredible guy he wrote his first book on a spiral bound notebook in the gents on his lunch break <laughs> every lunchtime he would go and he would just write in the spiral bound book and that became his book which then got turned into a film amazing yeah. so i think you're absolutely right it's just um it's joining the dot between that commitment to doing that and having that passion and that mm. nervous energy that you talk about that like this has to get made this has to this has to come out of me yeah i have to birth this into the world and Absolutely. it's kind of marrying it with the right things because sometimes we can get thrown off course a little bit mm. i'm also really interested by what you said about nobody owes you anything because i think that's a really sage piece of advice and sometimes it's the kind of thing that we can get tripped up on that did you think previously people owed you something to come to that realization. No, I, I don't think it was it was sort of actively like I'm owed anything. Mm. I think it was just the realization that you've kind of got to work harder to be noticed. You know what I mean? Mm. It was kind of like you can't just make a film and expect attention. I guess in the sense, yeah, expect that in that way it would be they owe me their attention because they're watching my film. But mm. even in that environment, like they don't, especially nowadays, you know, people switch off in the first 
10 seconds thanks to you know tiktok and youtube and stuff um <laughs> so, tiktok's destroying my brain by yeah. another but, conversation. but 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 you do need to grab people from the off you know and mm -hmm. then you know obviously once you've got a more of a track record and you have your your audience then people might have a bit more patience you know where you can kind of have the inciting incident take place a little bit later in your film or whatever mm -hmm. but really you know you need to grab their attention in terms of grabbing people's attention and and having that nervous energy that's not just in film anyway or writing a film it's not just getting the thing written it's actually sort of getting it out there mm -hmm. and like hustling you know we spoke about this in the past the you hustle. know it's absolutely essential because the reason this got made was because my core team were constantly moving things forward so you know i was writing with zach and improving it and, and my producer was sort of having their conversations and then i was having conversations and i found myself in certain situations where like it became quite natural to speak about it and even if it wasn't that natural you kind of make it natural to speak about <laughs> it um and that's actually how how famous got made but but with the accumulation of all of that stuff mm -hmm. but but interestingly i actually went to an event a screen international event because my casting director was a, a screen star of tomorrow um, isabella Rodolfin, and she offered me uh, to be her plus one um i'm very thankful for that so when i went to that event and you know just by being there and being into the industry of all these people that are plugged in mm. it, that alone can anything can come from that um and it, yeah just from that event i met someone who ended up totally changing my life and was the person that uh that said yes to this film essentially wow. yeah so Net networking is so Im important yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's it's everything. You know, there's the networking. When you know, when I went freelance, one of the biggest things that I f I found that was really helpful was just working from Soho and just like you know, I was working. Sometimes I go to the Picture House Central, uh, you know, and you'd see like people walking in there. Um, I don't know if I should name people, but you know, no, just... they were act they would often be because you and I used to both go to the pictures, right? And you'd see people with scripts, actors, uh, yeah. people that you knew were in film, and you're yeah. like, oh, they're just chilling out here because it's yeah. the film place. It was exciting. It was exciting, and also a bit kind of I had that <laughs> that nervous energy came back in because I was like, do I have a copy of my script? No, <laughs> I never did that. I never did that, but I always fantasize about doing that. Um, yeah, and just being in those environments, you know, and and just using your your energy to to keep improving the the make the product that you're trying to sell as as easy to buy as possible mm. um i got through that analogy just about um <laughs> and and being in those environments and conversations that you have you know i, th I think it's that that energy is everything really and also the thing about because that's really struck with me the thing about no one know, owes you anything but also i think it's that realization that your perspective is unique mm. so you can't expect people to see your project through your eyes mm. which is the challenge because right. it's like they they don't they might not care how do i make somebody who has the polar opposite view on this to me care absolutely well that that i think is the most important job of the director actually is to sell your vision to everyone else who's working on the film uh well f first and foremost the people that are going to pay for it um <laughs> at, and th and then the people that are going to mm. work on it, and that goes from you know the uh, cinematographer all the way to the runners. Like every single person needs to buy in. You have your heads of departments, the the people that you kind of you know your uh, um, stylist, co costume stylist, hair and makeup. Um, you've got your production designers, art directors. All these people uh, are so talented, and they're they're ready f to make your vision happen. So you have to get them to buy in. You have to get them to be passionate about it because they're going to be a lot better doing that than you will ever be. Mm. But as long as you can just kind of guide it into the same kind of direction, um, that's how you create the magic. And same with the actors as well. You know, I always like to work with my actors. I'd like them to have as much of themselves in the role as possible. I'd like, I mean, <laughs> other writers that I might work with now might, uh, not want to work with me when I say this, but I I do like um, improvisation. And if there's a line that in workshopping that doesn't feel as natural from the actor's mouth, I'd like them to say what would be more natural to mm -hmm. make the same point. And I'll almost always go with that way, you know, because for me, authenticity in 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 films and in your characters is what gives it value and what makes it 
great, I think. I thought in the film, there is not a performance that you you come away thinking every single performance is absolutely stellar, oh, by the thank way. Thank you. Thank you like, very much. Like, genuinely. I will take all the credit for that. <laughs> um, no, thank you very much. That No, I, I, I kind of feel like, I mean, I talk about it with my, my DOP mates, you know, my cin- cinematographer uh, friends, where the, f- the visuals are incredibly important. And for certain films, they kind of are the most important things for certain types of films. But the sort of films that I make is very much character and story driven. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that the cinematography isn't like incredibly important because I very much want to, I work with Angus Hudson on this. Um, uh, amazing cinematographer who who come off of a film with Sophia Loren, um, yeah, if you, which is part that was part of the um, <laughs> that was part of the what was so amazing about doing my first film in this way and being so lucky to work with Netflix is that mm. I had access to incredible cast and crew. Um, somehow, I have no idea how I went from that moment of the pandemic to just like on set with like this cinematographer that just worked with that's Sophia Loren. That's so <laughs> incredible because mm. it's a dream story. It, that's mm. what I find so incredible about this whole journey that you've been on is that I've heard so many people tell me their ideas over the friends not not that anyone pitches to me but I just you hear Can people you fund have, my next film <laughs> yes, I would if yeah. I could I would yeah, um and yet to see not only to see you do it and there's been a big gap between like the first time we ever met and talked about it mm. and it actually happening but yeah just just seeing you make it real and when I first, when I sat down and watched the film, as soon as it started, I started to clench because I was like, oh, that shot's so expensive. <laughs> I'm glad that's the reason why you're clenching. It's not because you thought it was a terrible film. No, <laughs> as soon as it started, I was like, oh, oh, this is, this is, and it sounds it's like proper, actualizing. This is a real this is a proper film. film. Yeah. He wasn't lying all that time. Yeah. 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 Um, no, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. It is, it is, it was a dream scenario to go from, the heart the hardest moment in my life to then you know i mean it was think it was february 21 where my agent called me and said that netflix wanted not just that film but the the new film that i wrote during lockdown it was that day um yeah it was quite mad actually my dad uh (laughs) turned up to just sort of drop some supplies over which was very kind of him and i was on the phone to my agent at the time uh outside of my house and he was like okay eddie's on a you know business call um <laughs> looking you know bye bye shelter um walking back and forth and um <laughs> i just had the, i remember the moment and she, uh, my jaw just dropped and my dad was like oh god who died <laughs> you know um and then got off the phone and told him uh, well i said hold on one second because my wife's gonna kill me if i don't tell her this first <laughs> went back in told ashley and then yeah it was a i told my dad it was yeah it was pretty mad no mm. one died i have been given life <laughs> yeah <laughs> My um, director yeah. career, my directing career has been given life. Yeah. Incredible. Okay. I know we've talked about some of the things that kind of got in your way, but let's talk about the biggest obstacle that you had to mm. overcome in order to get to this place where we are today. I know it does tie into going freelance and making those big changes. Yeah. I, th- I, I think I think the biggest obstacle, so yeah, so there, there's the kind of permanent obstacle of trying to, you know, achieve that dream uh from that kubrick gave me at five years old um (laughs) uh which is you know to get your film made and funded that that's the 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 permanent thing that's there and to find the to keep up that passion and energy you know um i i say it as if it's like it's just there but no you need to have the right project you need to be um you know uh in the right frame of mind to to create that you know but then in terms of the specific biggest obstacle it was very much that moment in in uh february march um my mental health took a really you know deep sort of dive kind of you know at that point again like like a lot of other people um i think not ha- not th- there was a lot of regret at that point because obviously i didn't have any furlough because i <laughs> i went freelance and those seven months from being freelance to that point were really great i i spent a lot of work and time on the film um you know there was a lot of uh, sort of priceless, I guess, um, time where I told my wife that whilst I didn't have any income, it, this is priceless what I'm doing today. <laughs> um, but um, that it was very valuable, you know, because I had, you know, if we didn't have the pandemic, I probably, I had a lot of work lined up, which was really exciting for sort of 
daytime, you know, day day job stuff. Mm. Um, and I had the chance to kind of do a lot of work on the film. But I think that moment was the biggest obstacle to not have any income coming in, to be, you know, needing to provide for my 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 uh, my wife and my my newborn baby, not being able to, and having the, I guess, um, positivity. I or the the kind of is it positivity the right word? There's energy. There's positivity. There's there's faith. Having the faith, I guess, is the best word to to to, to put there, to create something new that's going to take us out of it and really like I spent so many years with a film that I had total belief in so to create something new and so and that hadn't been funded yet mm. so it was kind of like um at the time it was a bit of a pipe dream because there's no guarantee in fact it's likely this will never get made as well as the other film but I just felt that's what I needed to do to get through it mm. um you know maybe I could have focused on trying to find I mean I, I did try and find ways of working and having an income uh within the realms of you know write basically writing you know commercials and branded branded content stuff because animation was still going on um or like uh stock footage films you know because mm -hmm. people weren't shooting yeah but the scripts were still being made so I got a little bit of stuff eventually with that but that I, I kind of focused on that but rather than retrain or refocus my energy which a lot of people had to do and I think if more time went on I, I would have done I kind of yeah used that obstacle to kind of double down into the thing that was probably really silly to do but it ended up working out so. it ended up working out and I know that when it comes on to your challenge you've already mentioned this this is about the money this is about convincing mm. people to invest in you and your idea Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that is the bit for any filmmaker trying to fund their first film. There's only a certain amount of ways you you can really go about it. One is to to go and make it yourself, which you know these days with the the, the access to high quality equipment is 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 a lot better than it used to be. But with that, there's a lot more stuff getting made. So to cut through, it's very very hard to do that when you're trying to make a feature film, or when you've made a feature film. Um, you know, it, there are still these kind of big pillars of the industry where like, you know, the BFI, you want to sort of get in with the BFI. Mm -hmm. uh, they support a lot of first time filmmakers and, uh, you know, Creative England. But it's very competitive and it's very, very hard to, to, to if you're lucky enough to get onto that. Uh, we didn't get onto that. So, you know, that, that also added into the, you know, trying to keep with the faith because the the very small amount of options that that were, were would be able to kind of fund your film or at least give you a bit of backing we'd gone through those uh we'd gone to them and been rejected um yeah so that was really difficult to keep the faith at that point um but we just had that belief do you know what i mean and that's really interesting in terms of a challenge because, okay, so there's a finite number of people or mm. resources that you can go to to get funding. Yeah. And you went to all of them and every single door was closed. So that would, to a lot of people, be, well, that's the end. You mm. all shake hands and say it was a fun ride. Have a happy life. Yeah. But it, we keep coming back to every single thing that you've had to work through yeah. comes back to this faith. Yeah. And yeah. this feeling in your heart that this has to get made. Absolutely. Yeah. I think... Um, that's just what kept it going. And I think there's so many times where it could have, I mean, there was a conversation where it was like, maybe this isn't the first project and maybe we just kind of try and focus on something else that's a bit more kind of sellable. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, a lot of people in the industry, um, they want what's called sort of genre films. You know, they want a comedy or a thriller or, you know, uh, or a horror. Those films tend to be, you know, for first time filmmakers, uh, a slightly easier route because it doesn't mean it, it's, it, it needs to be amazing, but um, it's just it's just easier to sell than this kind of uh, comedy drama, you know, that some people might look at as, you know, just kind of being worthy in any kind of way you know like which which it totally isn't that mm. but to try and convince people where they have only a certain amount of hours in the day so many scripts to read and it's like right i know what that is i'm gonna fund that what's this no you know that kind of thing mm. interesting okay now let's talk about opportunity yes because there are opportunities missed and there are opportunities grabbed with both hands. And you have talked about the opportunity that you grabbed with both hands. And I can understand why. <laughs> Please tell us what that was. 
so I guess the, the the biggest opportunity for me was was being given the backing by Netflix to go and make my debut feature, you know, with n a totally different mentality. You know, it wasn't a kind of, I mean, everything I'd made up until that point, well, most people until they make their first big film, you know, is uh, the financial constraints, mm. you know, and you have to come up with these creative solutions to kind of practical problems because you don't have... Uh, an unlimited amount of money and we didn't have an unlimited amount with this but um we had some amazing support you know for example that soundtrack for the film i have had most of those songs on a spotify playlist for years dreaming that we'd be able to afford them but knowing that it's like not probably not going to happen you know because you know we've got porter's head on there and we've got um uh the doobie brothers <laughs> we've got house of the rising sun you know so like uh, the fact that that could even be a reality and you know um um my i spoke to my music supervisor david fish m most days because the soundtrack for me was was so important and the fact that it was sort of oh we can potentially get this uh was huge um i always kind of um I don't know if we've spoken about this at all in the past, but some of my favorite filmmakers are, are the types that have sort of very curated soundtracks. So like Cameron Crowe, you know, who talks about his soundtrack ideas for his films being like that thick on a mm. piece of paper, but the scripts are like that thick. Um, are you going to mention Quentin Tarantino again? Uh, <laughs> and my friend uh, Quentin. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, but 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 yes. Um, and, you know, like Richard Linklater and Days and Confused. Mm. Um, so that was really important. Um, and then, uh, just as I said before, kind of having the ability to approach certain actors and certain, uh, crew where, you know, I'm sure we would have made something that I'd be very proud with, with, with not as much of that support, but to be able to have that support, mm. uh, was, was absolutely amazing. During the process, were there any times where you thought this isn't perhaps going the way I want it to, did, did you ever have to course correct? given that you were having to deal with lots of things, budget, uh, actors, lots of different departments, did you ever at any point, did it feel as good as you hoped it would? I mean, it, when you're making a film, that happens daily. I mean, you're making hundreds and hundreds of decisions a day. And not all of those decisions, you know, the, the things will present itself in a way where, you know, yes, I got the soundtrack that I wanted, but... Mm -hmm there's a street that our location manager found that was great, but then it turns out we can't use it. So we have to figure out a different way of kind of shooting the scene or there's lots of issues that do come up that, that it, I think in any film you get that from, you know, uh, something that's shot on a shoestring or something that's hundreds of millions of pounds to shoot. You know, that's part of the beauty of it, I think is, is, is being able to kind of figure out how to kind of maintain that quality and the fact that you can get everything you want despite running out of time, despite not getting the the right, you know, uh, you know, location you might want and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. But the fact that we had that backing from Netflix just made it made it easier or, you know, uh, and also my my producer, Colly McCarthy, who, who this is his first film. I was blown away by the fact that he, you know, led this from the front where I felt you know, the size of this for a first film is very, very rare. And I, I mean, will always be incredibly appreciative for that. I think we haven't have lost the kind of heart that we wanted to have with it mm -hmm. by, by having the ability to make those decisions. But uh, I was, I'm very grateful to Colly because I never, I never felt uh, so restricted that it's not gonna be what I want to make, if that makes sense. That's a nice experience. Um, let's talk about successes now. Obviously, the film has been incredibly successful, but that's not what you picked. Uh, yes, uh, no. My my main success is um, yeah, convincing my wife to to to, to marry me because um, I think I'm probably quite hard to live with, especially when all I go on about all day is um, is uh, the film I eventually want to make that probably won't get made. <laughs> um, and obviously, yeah, having having uh, being lucky enough to be a father to two to two little girls is absolutely my greatest success. Um, and then very far after that would be, yeah, making the film. <laughs> what I liked about it when we spoke about this before is you said, I still see myself as an eight-year-old, let alone a dad of two. Yes, that is true. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether I should say that um, because my wife's probably watching this or listening to this. Uh, yeah, just sort of nodding. Yep, I also see you as an eight-year-old, <laughs> let, let alone a dad of two. 
Um, I yeah. have the same complex. If it Do makes you? you feel any better, I still feel like a sixth former. Oh, really? I, yeah, it's it was imposter syndrome, isn't it? Mm. And I think that's. I actually think it's a good thing, very good thing to have and to maintain, um, because I think it keeps you on your toes. You don't get complacent. You need to kind of, you know, you. I I I I, I've, I always think you know when I turned up to set and you'd have hundreds of people, you know, and I'm there just sort of with my flat cap sort of at a coffee being like in my head sort of oh my god <laughs> um I, I i there's something about that that i actually think was but 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 not being overawed by it you know um for me that actually uh manifests itself into excitement mm. and it's the same for collie as well and i think being on set and being a director and also having your producer as well i think it's so important that it's especially nowadays, you know, where people are more aware of mental health struggles, especially in that in such an extreme environment. It's so important that that everyone feels valued, you know, from from as I say, from your heads of departments to to your runners, to your sparks, to your gaffers, to you know, everyone needs to feel that value because so long, you know, in the the industry has been you're lucky to be here, and I'm going to treat you like crap you know, and it's just not really on. Never was, but especially now it's, you know. I don't think it's reserved for film either. I think I think it was that thing which is hopefully um, disappearing now, which is the more important that you got, the bigger your title, the bigger your salary, the the more you could punch down. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you had been in that position where working your way up in the industry, you had been punched down by people above you, it actually, it takes a lot to break that cycle because you think it comes with the the growth or the mm. uh, progression. So it's really uh, cheering to hear you describe it the way that you describe it. I, I, look, I'm sure it still happens, uh, you know, in, in film. And certainly I know that it happens in other industries. But the the hope is, is that, you know, the com there is a conversation about it now, which will hopefully change things a bit. Mm. But I think for, for me specifically, and the nature of I Used to Be Famous as a film, it was so important to uh, to have an atmosphere that was firstly conducive to, we were working with neurodiverse talent who were amazing, you know, in the drum circle scenes uh, and obviously Leo Long, who, who was, you know, our lead, uh, co-lead actor um, in his first role. You know, working with people, uh, not only who are neurodiverse actors, but, but really, really everyone, it's very important that like, this is a job and you're ch you're you're here because obviously financially you're you're being paid because you're at your job but you want to do this job right people shouldn't be on set thinking oh my god i'm having a terrible time but i'm lucky to be here because of this and eventually um i'll be happy blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. it, it's so important because you get the best out of people if they feel valued and if they're happy on set and look sometimes if i'm honest like i was like a giddy little kid um <laughs> And that voice in my head of, oh, my God, would come out a little bit. But I think I think that that fed into people's excitement to be there. The the downside of it, which you do need to be aware of when you're basically like a, a, a kid in a candy store, um, is that, you know, if you are actually running out of time and you're having too much fun, <laughs> you might not make your day, which is really bad. Right. So so there are times where you will need to just sort of switch that off and just be, you know, you, you need to be very focused, especially if you're the director, because, mm -hmm. it you know, it, it I mean, I was always focused, but but you need, there are times where, especially certain scenes and the nature of certain scenes where you need to not let that kid in the candy store vibe go out. Um, uh, and then and make sure you make your days and make sure you get what you need, especially the the seri very serious scenes. Um, but yeah, that, I, I think it's important. And I guess that's only a muscle that you can build and develop and strengthen by being practical, by experience. the practice of doing it and experience, yeah. yeah. Um, so talk to me about any regrets that you have had and how they've shaped this experience. So, <laughs> so a few days after quitting my freelance job and finding out my wife was pregnant, that I, I think at the time I was like, I think I regret this decision. Uh, quitting the job and then being in a global pandemic and not having any income at that time, I think I regretted that. <laughs> but actually looking back, um, I don't regret anything at all. You know, I think um, it, the, the wrong decisions 
which I guess is a you know I kind of define regret as like me having made wrong decisions. Um, mm. I think that is part. It's all part of the process. I think hindsight, you know, is a wonderful thing. Um, but even with even with hindsight, having made that decision, there was a reason why you make that wrong decision at the time. Um, and I, I so I, I don't really like to live with any regrets, really. Yeah. I agree. I had an excellent guest on last year called Daniel Pink, who's written a whole, he has actually has a whole directory of regrets. So you can go to his website and you can fill in your regret. And he's written this incredible book. And he says, it's all data. It's all data. Like if you don't make mistakes, you cannot move forward and grow and develop because those, those exactly, as you say, are part of the process. Yeah. And they are part of the picture. And this idea that you can always be happy or that everything should always be wonderful is a really sort of dangerous image to put out there because mm. highs come with lows and they should because that's what that's the magical tapestry of life. Absolutely. <laughs> but but also it, you know practically speaking if I hadn't uh, in the moment where I'd gone freelance and I was in we were in the pandemic and I was I I was uh Will Ferrell was like I immediately regret this decision. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like actually if that hadn't have happened, uh, if I hadn't have quit the job, I wouldn't have focused my energies on on this new thing mm. that not only got that, you know, in development, which I'm writing now, uh, but got I Used to Be Famous made. You know, mm. there, there's so many of these wrong decisions that that had to happen in order to be where where you are, you know. Of all the people I thought you were going to quote today, Will Ferrell was not the one. <laughs> <laughs> really? Are you that shocked? Yeah, fair. Um, tell me about what you're proud of. Uh, I, I'm most proud of being a dad. I think that is, you know, that's every every day. Um, I always have this when, when there's a, <laughs> it might sound quite creepy. At, no, at night when I just when the two kids are down momentarily, and you just kind of completed a day as a dad, <laughs> you know, and you get you check on them, and it's just like that. I think that moment every day genuinely is like where I'm at my proudest. Um, uh, but yeah, also I'm I'm really proud of. Um, of what we achieve with the film. Um, you know, firstly, the fact that so many people have seen it um, and, and, and enjoyed it or seem to enjoy it. Um, but also um, working with Leo Long as, mm. um, uh, you know, a brilliant debut actor. It, this isn't a film about autism. This is a film about two people that meet. Um, and there's themes in there of, you know, brotherhood and friendship and missed, missed um, opportunities and, um, and wanting to uh, go and come into independence. And these are themes that are very universal. One of the characters happens to be autistic. And that is how, that is, to me, that's real life. And that's how we treated it within the film. It doesn't need to be a big focus. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what's interesting, you know, he, he, his um, arc was originally based on my cousin, Saul Zerspiro. From the autistics. From the autistics with an X, the uh, autistic, autistic uh, the rock band that have uh, uh, the majority of members uh, are autistic. And um, yeah, hit, so so I mean, I could tell you, should I tell you a bit about Saul's? Yeah. Show? yeah. So Saul really inspired me. Um, he's uh, a cousin of mine um, that uh, is autistic and has um, uh, sort of difficulties in his life. Um, he needs full time care. Um, and he has um, very high, high support needs. Um, he's become the most amazing drummer for this band called The Autistics. Um, when he was 10, he really didn't like loud noises, sort of crowds and, you know, dogs barking and babies crying. Um, it had a really bad effect on him. His parents uh, were very supportive with him with, with, when it came to sort of um, dealing with that. And one thing that was was amazing was actually music. Music was was actually one of the the keys for him. Uh, he got a pair of drumsticks when he was ten. They, his, his one of his elder sister older sisters played drums, and he sat at the drum drum kit. And it became quite clear once he picked up the drumsticks that there was, although he had a bit of difficulty holding them at first, he had a really good sense of rhythm. Um, and then over time, it became very clear that he was a pretty good drummer. And they formed this band called the Autistics. And cut a long story short, you know, a few years later, they're on stage in front of a thousand people performing uh, at a charity event. And Sir Tom Jones is in the front row 
and they invite him up on stage. No. Yeah, they just they're just Did like. Did he get up? He got up on stage, um, and you know the the thing about Saul is that he's got no um, no uh, ego. You know, and there's no uh, the, this guy Tom Jones. He's just a music mate. He isn't Sir Tom Jones. And oh my god, I'm going to be playing on stage with him. It's like great. He's just come, come. You like music? I like music. Let's play. <laughs> and it was magical. And and that tied into one of the themes of the film, which is you know Vince, who was uh, the representation of a bad side of the music industry, where it was based on you know uh, being a product and 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 uh, the commodification of art mm. versus what Saul represents and what Stevie represents, which is what music really sh should always be, which is about um, you know uh, pure enjoyment, you know, our human visceral need for 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 enjoyment uh, through music. Anyway, so 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 it's very important to, for for me that we cast uh, a neurodivergent actor or, or at least explored to a very thorough degree, mm. the neurodivergent talent that were around to play that role because they haven't been represented in the past and they've not been given the, that opportunity. So, uh, but the main thing was actually that um, the neurodivergent actor that would play that role would bring as much of themselves into, into it. You know, I obviously based the character originally on Saul, but he's not Saul, he, he's he's inspired by Saul. So what Leo did was he kind of took the character on, we, you know, we spoke and I spoke to his parents and we kind of molded that character into something that felt that he had so much ownership on, mm -hmm. of. And it ended up with him, you know, getting a, a, a Biffa nomination, which is, you know, which was genuinely like a life-changing moment for me personally. You mm. know? It's one of the, his performance is so charming. And I've told, I've already geeked out about it, but um, for anyone, just go and watch that and you'll know exactly which scene I'm talking <laughs> about. Um, talk to me about a time when you were wrong. I think I was first wrong when I started supporting Newcastle in 1996 <laughs> because we were amazing. And then I've spent the majority of my 26 years supporting them with us not being very good. However, this year we seem to be great but anyway that's were you supporting subject. alan shearer in 1996 basically that the yeah problem? Well, well this could become a football podcast if you want I'm, i could dive into it that's as far as i can that's go fine, with that. fine. <laughs> no but genuinely he joined the team and new the way newcastle played was very attacking and actually interestingly it does kind of relate to just you know what we're talking about because the newcastle team of that era were called the entertainers because they would just attack 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 and you know there's they'd score more goals than the other team and the defense was not really known to be that great but like the attack was so exciting mm. so um that's why i started supporting them and also because half my family are from liverpool and half are from london and i couldn't choose between a london or a, uh, or a merseyside team um and i thought newcastle was in the middle no i'm kidding no, no. <laughs> um uh never geography is never my strong point um but but that kind of yeah that that mentality of just yeah the faith i guess it's like you know attack 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 and mm -hmm. reach for what you want to get you know it didn't work that well for as a Newcastle fan for many years um but now we're looking good anyway um but no I think um I think not going full time sooner was something I got wrong I think I put off the reality that that was something that needed to happen for a few more years than it needed to be and, you know, my family and my wife were very, very supportive, but I think I should have kind of identified that sooner. Mm -hmm. um, I think I would have been further along. And uh, and also just kind of not, not always trusting my gut instincts. I think, you know, when making the film, as I said, there were so many decisions a day that mm -hmm. I needed to make and so many places I needed to be that um, learning for next time, I think your gut instinct you know, a lot of people kind of think uh, the gut instinct doesn't take into account the politics of certain decisions, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But actually, for me anyway, it certainly did. And that's why it was my gut instinct, because I was aware, you know, I, I kind of I overly thought through certain certain decisions that that I that every time I look back and this didn't happen very often. But when it did happen, I, I look back and I, I kind of think, no, 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 I should have gone with that first thought. Because even even though it's like an initial, it's a quick thought, and you don't think you've thought something through. Mm. It is kind of there anyway when you have that gut response. Does that make sense? Because I think sometimes gut instinct can seem like you just know. Yeah. And it doesn't factor in the experience or all the things that you've observed, and that's why your gut's telling you that mm. because it's processed all of that information. It can't necessarily tell you in a clear 
well thought out thought in your brain it just tells you from there just like and Absolutely. it's it's like jump or don't jump kind of feeling isn't it yeah exactly yeah and that's what you that's what you get to learn okay yes. i was interested to know about your weaknesses because mm. i think again knowing when you're wrong uh, having a really good sense of what you're not good at so that you can get better you talked about time management and anxiety but also something that i was actually surprised but delighted to see was you talked about how your weight changes mm. based on but I, I'm guessing what's going on with the time management and anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've always, um, I've always been quite extreme with being very disciplined and, and not having any discipline. It's really <laughs> weird. Um, and uh, I spend, you know, when I'm really, really busy, like a lot of people, you know, you don't find time to go to the gym or, or keep yourself fit and you, you, you know, I specifically, I'll eat to get through things, you know, mm -hmm. comfort, comfort eating. But it's really weird. It's like when when I'm not busy, well, I, I, there's always busy, but when I'm not in ex an extreme level of, of, of busyness, like on set shooting, um, I will go on this kind of like h hardcore diet, be overly disciplined mm -hmm. because I, I guess for me, dieting is so unpleasant that I want it to be over and done with as soon as possible. So I go <laughs> as extreme as possible. Um, but no, it, it's, it, it's not that crazy. I, 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 I diet um, and I just watch what I eat. I have a lot more water uh, and I'm, I'm very disciplined and I can lose a lot of weight quite quickly, but not in the, I never maintain that. It, it will, I'll always, as soon as I'm, I'm not active on the diet mm -hmm. and I'm not actively disciplined, Every, I just always make the wrong decision and then I very quickly put a lot of weight back on and I yo-yo throughout the year based on how busy I am and I'm trying to change that. Um, I actually just bought a treadmill, uh, like a kind of, yeah, relatively small little floored away treadmill. Right. Let's see if I open the box. <laughs> It depends on how busy I, I love am. the fact it's not even other folks <laughs> yet. It's not, yeah. Just been, bought a treadmill, Emma. I say just bought. It's been six months. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so we'll see. Because I've kind of, you know, I... I I've taken away the the uh, the um, obstacle of like having to actively go to a gym, yeah. you know. Um, so that's kind of what I've done there. But we'll see. Um, yeah, I think in terms of time management, that is something that I've always always struggled with um, ever since I was at school. And I tend to be the type of person that will procrastinate a lot, and then as soon as someone says, you know, basically threatens me with taking away what I want. I'll then rush and get it done. Part of that I like to tell myself is why the stuff I can create can be relative. You know, I'm quite happy with some of the mm -hmm. stuff I create, but I've never really seen whether I could do that earlier. And if I can do that earlier without having that stress, that will be quite life changing. I'm the same. Are you? If I have a deadline, then it will be the 48 hours prior to having to deliver when all of the work gets done. There will be an emotional input right at the very start. Then there'll be nothing. And then there will be... Right. And some listeners might be thinking, why are you delighted that Eddie's talked about struggling with his <laughs> yeah, weight? <hey>. And, <laughs> and the reason I said that, and I want to clarify, is because I think it's difficult for anybody to be honest about that. Mm. I'm very honest about it, but it's not. So, I know that it's conversations I have with people who wouldn't want to go on tape. But secondly, it's because it's not often you hear a guy say something like that. Right. Mm. So I'm really glad to sort of bring it out into the light, if you will. And also, I think with the weight thing I'm definitely someone where you can tell where my mental health is based on what's happening with how I'm eating mm. how I'm exercising so it's really interesting for me to hear that that's a similar thing for you yeah no that is that is interesting we're alike <laughs> we are alike <laughs> but yeah but it's it's the kind of thing that goes on very silently and mm. quietly in the back of one's head and it is almost like this internal saboteur it's a very private relationship that we have with our brain and our bodies and I'm speaking more to people, understanding that actually, I think we all have this sort of dialogue that's going on. Mm. There are very few people who don't have to think about mm. it mm, mm. or who, for whom it doesn't occupy some sort of brain space. So mm. I'm just thank, thanking you for um, being honest about it. Oh, you're your welcome. If you it. have the answers, please send them <laughs> on a postcard. Well, I might fill you in about something after this. <laughs> right, so we're gonna close off with what makes you hopeful because in talking about the difficult stuff, it's important to really reference the fact that all of these difficult things have led to good. Yeah. Because we're talking about them having been through them. So with all of this experience under your belt, what is it that makes you hopeful for the future? Um, I think the main thing for me 
there's two things really what one thing is i hope that the industry i hope our film goes a little way you know um in in making people that want to finance films or the decision makers on who to cast and who to crew um where they look at neurodivergent talent uh in a different way to how they looked in the past mm -hmm. um and they give opportunities to to people because we've proven you know with with leo and some of the crew as well um but also the 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 cast in uh mainly in the drum circle scenes mm. um that you have to give neurodivergent talent um opportunities especially when it's their stories mm -hmm. um so that's what that's one thing i'm hopeful for um the other thing is um the nature uh, we've touched on it but the nature of 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 the industry and being on set and making people feel valued and this the, going away from this kind of old like weirdly romanticized thing about like treating people like shit you know and like even some of my f favorite filmmakers you know of the past i won't name names um in those kind of in you know eras of the you know the 60s and the 70s and the 80s there's like legendary stories about how horrible they are. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I, I hope that, that, uh, you know, in order to get the, the incredible performance or the incredible shot and they did this amount of horrible stuff to their crew and their cast to get it and it isn't, look how amazing it is. And it's like, can we just like move away from that? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can. Um, and I think, and I think we are as well. I think in this day and age, it's just not. There's certain things now that um, there's certain lines that that um, are now red lines, mm -hmm. which I think are uh, a positive thing. So I'm hopeful about that as well. Eddie, I've loved this conversation, and for many reasons. But I think because we've sw we've talked very specifically about making a film, but I think anyone listening to this can apply a lot of what you've said to an office that they work in mm -hmm. or any kind of experience that they may be having. And I'm, I'm going to quote uh, Robert Downey Jr. Because in knowing you and also uh, reading up on how the film was made and looking at other things that you've said, something, <laughs> an Avengers reference came to mind. Excellent. Which is yeah. <laughs> um, faster alone, further together. Mm -hmm. And what really jumped out at me about the making this film is how it's this passionate idea that you had but it wasn't until you collaborated and trusted other people and championed them that things moved and, and gained momentum. And I think that's a, a good lesson for all of us. Thank you very much. I, I totally disagree with everything you just said. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. No, no, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, and um, yeah, I, uh, I believe it. I'm still learning, you know, I'll come back next time and, uh, totally uh just dis disavow everything i've said but bring your oscar uh, next time i'll bring the oscar. oh god <laughs> now he said it yeah. after the after i met you i remember um setting to charlotte and just saying he you know he's gonna do it don't you oh that's very kind that's very kind why weren't you saying that to me when i really needed you to say that to me in the ho horrible time no, okay. i didn't okay. know i okay. didn't know yeah at that point you weren't sure no, no. <laughs> um thank you i was I, on the fence yeah i appreciate it thank you it's a pleasure um listeners please go and watch i used to be famous which is currently streaming on netflix thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed this episode then make sure you're subscribed so you never miss a show and why not tell a friend about the podcast if you want to watch what happens behind the scenes, then head over to my Instagram where I'm at Emma Guns. And if you want to get in touch with me and share any risks, obstacles, challenges or curveballs that you've faced and overcome, then tell me on the beauty podcast at gmail.com. And it may feature in one of the midweek shows. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will see you on the next one. Mm -hmm.